Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here today as we uh, have our group of esteemed panelists to talk about complementary or competitive, which really in its own sense starts talking about uh, some of the more diverse perspectives that we'll bring today and the role of market infrastructures in real-time payments. I'm thrilled to say, to let you know, that we have a very diverse panel and we have an international footprint unlike any other. When we look at the experiences of our panelists, and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in just a minute. Uh, we have represented today with us uh, the Australia Payments Network, where modernization of the payment infrastructure is currently underway. Uh, they had actually released the Australia Payment Plan in December 2015 that had an outward view to the next 10 years of payments within their, their region. We have representation from one of our key global transaction banks, uh, Bank New York Mellon, uh, really who has responsibility for every aspect of payments from correspondent banking to real-time payments, international ACH, and the list goes on. Uh, we have a payment service provider in Europe, uh, in traditional mass payment with representation from Equins and Worldline, which interestingly enough, when we take a look at the type of innovation, digital capabilities certainly are front and center on what you will offer with your customer base. Um, and then a service provider, Earthport, for access to global payment networks, which is also a recognized financial institution under UK's Financial Conduct Authority, and also the Chief Risk Officer. And when we start thinking about the convergence of fintech and banking, I find that that's a really interesting combination when we look at that organization. And uh, I'll add today, although moderator uh, uh, Lisa Lansdowne Higgins, I'm Vice President and of uh, Business Deposit Treasury Solutions with World Bank of Canada. I'm also the Canadian representative on the SWIFT Board of Directors. Modernization for us is front and center, and we have collaborated with many of the uh, different countries around the globe who have also modernized, so we're still looking at best practices and how it is that we can accelerate in our own market. Um, but with that being said, I'd actually want to turn it over to the speakers and uh, have them introduce themselves and share a quick view on today's topic and panel. So Leila, would you like to start first for us? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. I'm Leila Fouri. I'm with the Australian Payments Network, the Chief Executive Officer, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here, particularly because next, month's our financial, next month our financial institutions will be going live with an important uh, point in the modernization of our payments environment with our new real-time rails, which will very importantly unlock the opportunity for innovation in overlay services going forward. So we see this as a very important point in our history and highly relevant to the topic today. Yes, I, an, an awful lot of work going on and, and we're all anxious to see the results that will Indeed. come out next month for sure. Uh, Michael Steinbeck, would you like to uh, introduce yourself next? Hello everybody, my name is Michael Steinbach, uh, CEO of Equins Worldline. Before becoming CEO uh, of Equins Worldline, I was CEO on in Equins. So, and uh, since yeah, well, yeah, a year ago, mm -hmm. 1st of October 2016, we did the merger of uh, Equins and the financial service part of Worldline, created Equins Worldline, and uh, beside my role as CEO of Equins Worldline, also heading the financial services of Worldline. Happy to be here today. I think it's. Uh, uh, a very interesting panel and uh, also the theme on correspondent banking and uh, what we now experience, the, the changes uh, in the market, uh, uh, what this will bring to correspondent banking, I think is uh, uh, very important. We are not so far than Leila than you in uh, Australia, so uh, a lot of people will, will look at you, but also at uh, Australia as such, at the community. <laughs> uh, from an Equins Worldline perspective, we uh, uh, clearly uh, believe in a upcoming global payments instant world. So uh, sooner or later, uh, we firmly believe that we are already in an instant world living and that uh, it will now also develop into it. Yeah. 
with the now upcoming uh, developments we have in the market and of course mm -hmm. also having influence on the correspondent banking as such and the business there. Well, it's certainly interesting to see your footprint from an EU perspective yep. and uh, how those payments are already moving yep. really across borders. So having that perspective, especially uh, given the topic today, is, is very relevant. Andrew, did you want to go next? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andrew Brown. I'm the Chief Risk Officer of Earthport. And Earthport is uh, really sits at the very heart of this question because we uh, have a proprietorial network um, similar to an international ACH or correspondent banking network. Um, and we work with banks and uh, some of the big e-commerce providers, uh, big corporates. And we have a footprint across uh, at least 65 countries of our own network, if you like, and as a SWIFT member, access beyond. So the heart of this question, you know, whether it's competitive or, or, uh, or collaborative, etc., is something that um, Earthport has been navigating for uh, at least the five and a half plus years that, that I've been there and continues to do so. And I think our experience and our uh, learnings, if you like, is, is very relevant to this. I hope to add some value from that perspective. Yeah, I would absolutely have to agree. And also providing a unique perspective on how it is that you uh, position Earthport with respect to the banks and co collaboration, mm -hmm. and how it is that you're moving that forward uh, across the different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, if Mike, if you would like to also introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, glad to be here as well. My name is Mike Pelicosa, and I'm responsible for the payments business for BNY Mellon. So fundamentally, if we look at cross-border payments, correspondent banking. It's the largest component of what we do. But also, as in Australia, we're from a real-time payments perspective, we're kind of neck and neck in terms of rolling out our real-time payments capability in the US. And actually, we're going to be one of the first banks to actually have some of the first transactions come across that network starting in November. So we're very excited about that. And this topic, this issue, in terms of advancing really the, the cross-border payment space and how best to do it is something that we are in deep. You know, there's so many initiatives, so many various elements in terms of directionally what is the most appropriate way to spend our time and resources collectively as an industry to improve cross-border payments. So I think we're all on board with it needs to be done. The question is what's the most appropriate path? What makes sense? from a participation perspective, and even kind of important things like the economic models to make those work, to get buy-in and participation from the right places, right people at the right time is critical, right? So it's a, this is another path for that, and uh, it's a great discussion topic. <coughs> Absolutely, you know, it's really interesting. I think even CyBoss, an event such as this, brings those type of conversations to the forefront. I know my breakfast this morning was bringing uh, some of our Australian counterparts together with the uh, UK and the experience that they had there so that we could share best practices. But prioritization and where you want to put your efforts and keeping the, the client front and center is always really important. Well, we're going to actually kick off. We're going to put a poll out uh, to the audience. Uh, we want to get your feedback right up off the off the bat. Now, if you can get your uh, smartphones out and you've downloaded the Cyboss app, uh, you'll actually be able to uh, follow the instructions. In the bottom right-hand corner uh, is a menu uh, that will allow you to pick conference room three. And uh, within uh, conference room three, uh, you'll actually be able to uh, interact <coughs> with uh, this conference and answer the, the poll question that we're going to put in front of you. Will you be able to put the question up? I can read it here. Thank you. So the question was, if you believe all payments, domestic or cross-border, will over time move to instant, will the current correspondent banking model be ready to respond? Yes, without any doubt. Yes, but with significant changes. No, market infrastructures will take over traditional correspondent banking business. Or no, innovative market players will replace classic banking models. And we'll just give you a couple of minutes. I always, I always find that music a little interesting to be back to when I was uh, really young. And it's, it's interesting. So with significant changes, and uh, 
Well, we definitely have a mix in the audience as uh, we're finalizing the and closing off the, the, the poll. Um, so it's almost like a balanced mix in the room uh, that uh, we're looking at the role of market infrastructures, maybe taking a broader role, as well as correspondent banking that we need to change and figure out what those efforts might look like. Well, to kick off today's session, uh, we, we've really uh, positioned the panel questions around a couple of themes. We really wanted to start with barriers and what the barriers around cross-border payments might be. So, um, and Andrew, I'm gonna pose the question to you first. In your experience, what have been the biggest obstacles to cross-border payments, and do the challenges change with the exchange of cross-border and instant payments? So I suppose uh, we've, a, we've a lot of experience of that, and the challenges have changed, um, but there are core um, hurdles, if you like, to overcome that, that, that remain uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And I would say the first and most obvious one of those um, uh, that is regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, regulation because there is no single regulatory environment at a global level. There are guidances uh, under the FATF, for example, on financial crime regulations, which have domestic interpretations, which are very, very similar and in inclined to the same outcomes. Um, but the way that uh, institutions have responded to meeting those obligations over the years in terms of building systems and technology means that they're bought into those systems for a long time. And, uh, uh, and that means the, the, the slight changes that there might be in interpretations of requirements can be really difficult to, to make meet at every border when you're doing uh, multiple transactions across uh, multiple jurisdictions, I should say. So regulation is, is one. But I think possibly even the, the, bigger, uh, the bigger challenge is the culture of the environment. Um, correspondent banking model is an old model and it served uh, a lot of business, a lot of individuals very well for payments internationally for a long, long time. But it has a lot of flaws. Uh, there's a very good argument that it's uh, beyond its lifespan, I think. Uh, but changing people who are in a, a global industry that has been very successful and built on that for decades, getting them to move away from the idea that that is the solution that has to be tweaked to meet the next challenges mm -hmm. and getting them to acknowledge that no maybe actually that is no longer the solution period that is very very difficult yeah, yeah I, I well I think many of us grapple with culture change without question and then if I if I play back just a little to take that to a global stage and how it is that we come together to at least address or identify where we feel that there may be barriers today that are real and or which are those that are more imprinted into the behaviors that have been there for a very long time. And, and uh, Michael Steinbach, I was just wondering from your perspective uh, with Equins and uh, the experience that you bring from a European perspective, your thoughts on barriers uh, within the, uh, the marketplace? Yeah, so we from uh, Equins World, I think we take a little bit the, the, the view from a, from a processing transactional point of view. Of course, there are all the regulatory uh, barriers uh, uh, we have. Uh, we still experience this in Europe, although you might see this as, 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 as one, one country, quote unquote, one region. But we experience still uh, today from country to country, yeah, uh, still different legislations yeah, on different levels, uh, uh, which, which makes it uh, uh, difficult. But from a processing point of view and correspondent banking, one of the biggest barriers is, of course, to connect to the local network. Mm. This was, from our experience so far, also always a big effort yeah, to, to, to have. Um, and, and, and therefore, I believe that uh, uh, the developments we are now uh, uh, recognizing uh, in the market where yeah, consumers are changing their, their, their behaviors. We get waves of uh, technology uh, changes. Yeah? Um, we have new non-bank entrants yeah, in, in the market, bringing new business models, new operating models. While the traditional banks are faced with a ton of regulation, yeah? uh, these developments uh, together, uh, uh, I think, with the uh, uh, now instant payments, open banking uh, uh, developments now coming up <clears throat> is from our point of view 
now really a, a start which uh, brings a standardization uh, of payments processing uh, on a global scale. So of course we in Europe now are ahead of uh, the launch of the EPC SEPA credit transfer instant rulebook. Uh, but still, we firmly believe and see also a sequence world line that this now takes already a more global approach. With the ISO 20022 as a standard, I think we are all using them more, more or less, and there are derivatives of, of that, of course, and we need to uh, get regulation uh, together. But we firmly believe in an upcoming, as I said, global instant payments world, we have, of course, to get the barriers off. They are regulation, it's about finality of settlement, uh, currency conversions, yeah, but it will be, as we are using today Google, getting an information everywhere in the world where we are, we get this information. So we don't get the information that, thank you for your request, you will get the info tomorrow. So uh, this will be the same with payment. We are living in an instant world. We are living in this world, and it will come to the payments as well. So that is our firm belief. We are developing our infrastructure on that so that we then can also step by step go with the developments which we see in our mainland in, in Europe, but uh, across the globe. And I'm, I'm sure, Leila, in, in, in Australia, we will have a good uh, showcase. <laughs> well, that's a, a good a segue, yeah. and I, I think there was a lot underneath there, from open access to regulation, really yeah. level playing fields, and how do you actually remove barriers to get us there? And Leila, your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I, I think that the two points that have been made are, are, are really valid. There are probably three major areas that I, I think are, are concerns or barriers in where we need to be regulation, as, as has been uh, raised. Uh, standards or technology, and then security. So I think under regulation, I'd add privacy in addition to the AML type uh, problems. Um, and I think in terms of real-time payments, what, what is really troubling us and keeping us awake at night is that there are more than 25 countries right now who have real-time payments. And so nationally, this is a really becoming a, a fairly well-established, commoditized solution. But what we don't have is a contiguous, uh, knitted together, networked effect between those countries. And um, I think that that, that leap is, is a profoundly important part of getting over those barriers uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I, we've all, like, it's running the gamut because we, you touched on AML in there, and I, I would think the privacy aspects really continues to also be front and center. And, and Mike, uh, I, I'm wondering your thoughts from a, a GTP perspective. So yeah, so I, all valid, you know, in terms of issues and uh, topics. Certainly, the regulatory component is important. Ultimately, as I look at it from a financial institution perspective. The whole concept of gatekeeper role into and out of a marketplace and who's going to perform that role is ultimately banks perform at a very high cost, uh, government surveillance supporting, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, covering of uh, sanctions and other scanning and other functions and the like and anti-money laundering and all these things at a relatively high cost. and. Um, when you put together infrastructures, ultimately somebody's got to be responsible for how that works. And there's models to probably make that work. But again, getting agreement across governments, harmonizing regulatory components, that's a, that's a, long, that's a long tail associated with that. Um, I think formats, uh, you know, in, in terms of standardization is important. But what we've seen over time, especially with um, agreements on the type of information, uh, even under a standard, you don't have a standard, right? There's different interpretations of how to use data, harmonizing all those things and, and the like. And the other thing which is ultimately most important is the, the driver of the change, right? Who's gonna make the change? Because ultimately there's a cost and um, those horrible banks have paid for these infrastructures and paid a, a ton of money to develop the internal domestic in infrastructures, which fundamentally they don't get paid for. 
right, as a starting point. So there's a financial incentive that they drive a lot of their payments revenue from cross-border payments. So creating models that say, well, now we're going to take that, open it up, and basically these are going to be kind of free transactions. So make continued investment, drive change in the industry to open up and connect these cross-border, uh, uh, these um, domestic clearing systems to each other. And, and it's not being, uh, you know, head stuck in the sand or anything else. It's just an, it's just an economic reality or the fact that they don't want change or don't want to improve it. I think it's what is the right change that creates the right incentives and the right models to improve it. Connecting cross-border, connecting domestic payment systems to each other is not the only way to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. I think in general, all will agree, things need to improve and how it needs to be improved. But the economic value in the participants will drive the interest in that solution, right? And then who's gonna pay for that solution? So if you're paying for the solution, it better have a benefit for you, right? So that, that's part of kind of from an obstacle perspective, those two things have to be aligned. The people paying for it have to get the value out of it. And, and that, I think that's where you kind of have some, some disconnects in terms of what's the best alternative to go forward. Yeah, Andrew, you look like you want to, uh, <laughs> to yeah. add to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I obviously I, I I see there's there's some legitimacy in that position, but it's it's also uh, to me a little bit um, disingenuous to talk about the people who pay for it uh, as if that's the banks, because it's the consumers and the customers that pay for it. Yeah, I, 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 I I'll let you finish yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, um, okay. and and the consumers and the and the customers in a domestic environment aren't ever going to be able to pay for a service in, if you like, the settlement country when they send, other than there being a reciprocal part, if you like, of the, of the payment being made. So in that sense, it is a shared environment already. It's always been a shared environment, correspondent banking I'm talking about, in terms of the payer and the user. There are other alternatives, uh, uh, Earthport's position, and there are other providers um, that connect these domestic ACHs. Uh, act as the central hub to manage all those differences mm -hmm. because, precisely because, some of the comments that have been, been made here are quite correct. We're not going to see in our lifetime a single narrative for legislation that encompasses all the countries of the world at a legislative and regulatory level, at a data management level, at a privacy protection level. So actually, perhaps, the solution is to think about having uh, a central singular coordinating function and that can be a company or a group of companies or or an industry so i my point on paying for it is actually physical capital mm -hmm. out of your pocket to make investment in developing capabilities how much was how much is it costing the industry the banks it's the banks are paying to develop real time payments in Australia. So it's certainly yeah. a sizable right. number. So there's, there's big numbers associated with doing that. And all, all um, you know, the discussion is about this capital outlay to make these things happen, to improve systems, to do it. Doing it out of the goodness of your heart, again, it's, it's what is the role of the financial institutions in the market. So if it's a public utility, Absolutely, I see that as a model, right? That makes sense. And then you're gonna make those investments, you're gonna do it, it's for the greater good. You improve payments globally. But just from a basic sense of investment and what you're going to purchase, and if you're not going to get an economic value out of that, it's a tough model. It's a tough model to get payers to buy into. That's, all, that's it. And they are laying out the cash to build the system. It's true, but it's, it, you know, you, the way you describe it there, it sounds as if it is completely an open free market, and it's not. It's a regulated environment. It's a privilege to be able to serve, and the uh, investments that are made are made within that framework. It isn't just a free-for-all. So there is a, there is a uh, if you say, I don't want to say a greater good, it is not a public utility, I totally accept that, but there is a, a, a contract with the, with the regulator on behalf of the government that you will deliver service. I can give examples of that in, in, in the permissions of uh, that, 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 that the institutions you know, receive for that investment. Uh, an obvious one at the moment would be the way go, uh, government regulators have responded to de-risking. 
and when they've had to remind the, the banks that you have an obligation beyond just the immediate obvious P&L to your, to your shareholders, etc. So I, I think there's something between there. There is, a, there is an argument in both directions there. I think it, it's uh, it, clearly when you look at it from different perspectives and the implications of regulatory investment prioritization and how it is that we actually look to serve our markets for sure uh, can have differing views. Where we land is probably the most important. And, and uh, Mike, you were, you were talking about technology. And I know when we were thinking about the aspects around instant payments and market infrastructure, we knew that technology, as you indicated, had to be fast-tracked from a development in that space. Um, but what else should be the, the participants be mindful of as we launch new payment systems? Yeah, so, yeah, it's obviously critical in terms of the execution of these models and that um, they're relatively simple to, e simple to use, and from a technology perspective, especially if you're going to provide from interoperability, the transaction set, what you're going to transfer between participants, needs to be well understood, easily migrated from one market to another, um, carry the data that's appropriate, be able to be delivered in the appropriate markets as done. So each part of that requires some uh, thoughtful view as you go cross-border, as each scheme has developed its own view of what it's going to provide, how it's going to provide, what local market practices are, mm -hmm. and you know you can harmonize that to a bit, uh, a bit, but um, fundamentally, the model there is a little bit challenging because it does get to be a little bit market-specific. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, providing and accommodating that for the clients that are going to make those yeah. transactions cross-border. It just has to be working very closely together to make sure it works. Their technology to you is efficient and effective. Mm -hmm. Your technology out into the market is effective and efficient right. to kind of execute appropriately to make, it, to make these things work. And I, I know, Michael, that you'd actually talked a little bit in the, the last uh, discussion around technology. And uh, I'm just wondering if you wanted to uh, explain a little bit more around some of the opportunities that you've seen within uh, Equins. Yes, so, and perhaps also coming a little bit on, on, on the theme uh, uh, of the panel, yeah, uh, uh, competitive or complementary. So, um, as I said earlier, how we see the developments uh, uh, in, in the market, uh, we uh, firmly believe, and I think uh, it was also confirmed, uh, Mike uh, made this statement, I think very clearly, there are uh, uh, tremendous investments in front of the financial industry, to, to build a uh, real-time infrastructure. And about that, we, only, we do not only talk about payments, it's about the whole IT infrastructure, because it's end-to-end. -end. So, and what we experience at least is that based on this development and based on our view that from a payments processing point of view, we are entering into the end game scenario of processing, that processing becomes a complete commodity in the future with the standard. It's even more about scale. And that in the future, you have to find the right, let's say, solution. And from my perspective, globally, there are perhaps two hands full of banks. One is sitting here on, on the panel who have size and scale yeah, to do that. But for a lot of others, yeah, it becomes let's say, very difficult to sustain this. And because processing becomes a commodity, the, let's say, competitive factor in payments and in the developments we see is moved from a processing perspective to the more service and product uh, uh, perspective, where you can differentiate, where consumers, corporates will decide which, let's say, financial institution they, 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 they mm -hmm. choose. So this is why it becomes even more a scale game and uh, um, we in Europe now, and here are also a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, European participants in, in the room, we 
clearly see an already ongoing consolidation of payment market infrastructures uh, and, of course, a lot of projects, programs running from even also tier one banks, um, critically questioning what is my operational model of the future with all this coming up. And I think there we will see uh, a, a quite tremendous shift also from local to global competitive markets. So this is uh, uh, our firm view on that. Um, and uh, in other words, in a foreseeable uh, uh, time, uh, a bank or, or a financial institution will not make any money and business out of a nice payments app. Yeah. So there will be a complete change in business models and the view how you develop. Yeah? It will be the service which you differentiate and the product which you differentiate, but not the processing. This becomes a commodity. That's yeah, obvious. It, I, it's really interesting, Leila. I know that as I was doing a little bit of research from uh, the Australian Payments Council, almost, Michael, to your points as well, there was a quote in there that really stood out to me that said, the payment system is the lifeblood of the economy. Yeah. And when you think about... Uh, how we're moving forward with respect to payments and moving beyond just the, the a commoditized view of it. You know, I'm just wondering from a technology investment as well as in, in Australia, uh, I'm curious uh, your thoughts on it. Absolutely, and I, I fully concur with Michael that uh, real-time payments is becoming commoditized. And it, it, it makes me think of a, a man that my son likes to call a philosopher, Freddie Mercury, uh, who gave those inimitable <laughs> words, I want it all and I want it now. Mm -hmm. and, and so customers, that's a, a wonderful expression of, of where customers are at now. They don't just want it now, but they want it all. And so real-time payments are, are not sufficient to sustain us as a financial services uh, environment. We have to have real-time fraud, real-time end-to-end digital customer solutions. And so what we've built in Australia is an underlying set of rails which um, enables additional value-add services to be added onto the underlying rails. And it, it presents an interesting, uh, perhaps hybrid or, or dynamic, which, in which the large financial, traditional, classical banks have invested in, but creates an opportunity for partnership with fintechs and uh, non-traditional players to create and define new services which would overlay on top of the underlying infrastructure. And so I don't see a world, I, th I think real-time payments is today's issue. I see a world in the future where um, real-time fraud, big data, AI are, are crucial drivers. So those customers who want it all and want it now expect that we as payments processes or financial institutions will read and understand the uh, financial dynamics in the market and from an AI perspective, interpret those and integrate those and personalize those in my payments profile and, and my payments transactions and that they'll do it of immediately. Um, and so we're at, an, at a really interesting time in payments. It certainly uh, reminds me of opening plenary with Gottfried and uh, uh, he, his example around AI and the future. And you know, if you look back at, uh, at some particular movies, uh, that that had been exemplified. But if you take a look at AI, it's hot, it absolutely is front and center on the conversation today. But that, uh, Andrew, I think that leads right into your space and, and how you've been approaching it. But I, I don't disagree with you. I like the phrase, I want it all, I want it now. But I, I, I am, there's a slight sort of caveat I have on that, which is just that um, yeah, the customer base, the consumer base wants it all and they want it now. But not every individual customer wants everything, and not every individual customer wants what they want right now. So when I think of real-time payments as, as, as one of the cause of, of the discussion here, um, I'm struck by the fact that I can see, and we see uh, at Earthport, because we're hooked into those places where it already is a possibility, and we're able to deliver that uh, to, to, to international clients, so in the UK, for example. 
uh, and we look forward to what's happening in Europe with the uh, EBA's uh, RTGS solutions, etc. But uh, I'm also aware that there are lots of places where it's not available, and it's not always a big problem. It's, there isn't always a clamour for it. We're taking a very sort of, if I may say, Western European, North American view here that everybody's demanding real-time payments for everything. No, some people and some institutions are demanding real-time payments for some things. I pay standing orders, you know, every 30 days out of my bank account to a number of providers, and I don't care if they <laughs> take 10 seconds or 10 days. I can transmit them within a, a, a plan and, and my provider can deliver them. So I think that there'll be, I think it, there will be a lot of solutions available to meet different needs. And I think partnership, as, as Leila says, between the institutions uh, that, that currently have access to those customer bases and those institutions that can perhaps differentiate, as M uh, Michael described, uh, on service and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, those that will be the mosaic of solutions uh, mm -hmm. across the space. And it won't be real time for everything. There'll be different costs. There'll be providers that can provide enough volume in one area and not in another. And, and I, I think that's a good thing. I think it breaks up some of the, some of the monoliths that have, been, uh, that have had an inertia. You know? Yeah, it's, it's interesting where we started the conversation from a technology perspective. Some of the potential challenges in front of us uh, the large investments, but even more importantly, where we're going to take it. So I think having that variety and challenging the market, which is really interesting, because as we look at the, the last area that we want to talk about, and, and for the audience, uh, you do have your app if you'd like to send some questions through. But if you want to think about some, some questions now, uh, we're going to open that up in a couple of minutes. But that clearly is that there's no doubt that correspondent banking has to evolve in order to survive. And we're curious, what do you think the priority should be? And uh, Michael Steinbach, I thought we'd start with you. So the priorities, I think I already mentioned uh, them, is uh, to really look on and, and get an opinion and a view out of uh, how the market will develop. Uh, what are the priorities? Uh, 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 do I uh, uh, further uh, uh, earn money in uh, processing uh, uh, back office of correspondent banking payments or whatever, uh, or what are my, let's say, uh, core business lines. Yeah? And there, uh, uh, I believe everybody has to, to ask these questions, to make up their minds. There is no, for me, uh, a red line where you can say it's, it's like that. It's for each and every bank, let's say, a, a different uh, discussion. There is not one close to the other. And uh, uh, there is a high diversity. From, from that perspective, uh, uh, I believe that in the future, correspondent banking will at least bring that uh, uh, by having today uh, 1,000 correspondent banking accounts, that this will dramatically go down mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, in this example, perhaps 80 or, or 100. Um, because uh, with this uh, commoditization and standardization, going on in, in the back office, yeah, and uh, uh, the services provided and market infrastructures uh, uh, like Equins Worldline, like uh, in Australia, or, or service providers also like uh, Earthport, but also banks, yeah, uh, global acting banks yeah, like uh, Bank of New York Mellon. Yeah, I think there uh, uh, will be a, a stronger consolidation uh, coming up, and it's good. I think the market has all the choices, uh, and this is uh, what it is about, a competitive market. But overall, it's a dramatic change in correspondent banking. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the question, what is correspondent banking in the future then? So of course, there is uh, still will be reciprocity, re so yes. forward, backwards, that yeah. this will still still stay. But what it was so far, also tremendously steered by payments processing. Yeah? I think this will, will in a way vanish and, and other priorities have to, and, and this will uh, lead to a shrink of correspondent banks uh, uh, you have then in your, in your portfolio. Interesting, so from a, a consolidation, rationalization, it'll be a natural yeah. course as we work through that. Um, I know that you were uh, really passionate from a prioritization perspective. Oh, I'm passionate. I wondered, <laughs> I wondered what your thoughts were on that. 
Yeah, so I think as I started off with, I think there are paths here to, to solve for these problems, right, and, and to make things better. And I think, you know, the paths obviously, um, you want to find ways that allow for, at least from my view, an incremental improvement of the service over time. You manage the investment, you continue to improve, you continue to invest. And from a banking perspective, you want to keep it bank centric, right? right? Ultimately, that's what you, you have control in a lot of respects of a marketplace. And you want to retain that, right? And it's an important part of what uh, companies, uh, but banks are doing. So with that, I think you know one of the areas that you know is well known within within this community is the Swift GPI initiative. We're fully on board with that, and I know it gets kind of mocked as not going far enough, but it's the first steps of what ultimately can be an incredibly powerful system that remains bank centric, mm -hmm. uh, leverages the networks that are already in place from a um, uh, participation perspective. The investments are made by the parties that are going to be, again, still remain central to it. And over time, what we can end up having is um, a far more robust system, right? So the vision, at least, that we're talking about getting to, and I was, you know, I've been deep on the development side with the part of the pilot banks. and originally developing V1 and we're working on the vision going forward. But ultimately, we see a place where um, there is a global SWIFT overlay, a network overlay that connects the participants globally. You know, we're already working on the, the, the distributed ledger component to be able to do settlement from a uh, participant perspective, right? So that's a great place to be able to settle for us. We should be, once we're API connected to SWIFT in this overlay, be able to send, send instructions up, develop a whole new SLA, which is, say, the 15-second SLA between willing participants, go up into that network, and then distribute and confirm mm -hmm. on the other side. That's a path forward. Then you can start incrementally layering on other services. You want a directory, right? So I want to be able to direct transactions to a particular party using aliases. You want to be part of the directory? We load up, we make part of the directory. You want to validate the account information before you send. The API, you go up into the directory, validate before you send. So all the components there, so if you have the components of what would be an optimized service to be able to distribute transactions globally, you have the participants that are building it to benefit their service and what they're going to offer directly to their, to their clients. And then the ability to continue to add on overlay services and improve that experience, then without having to redefine something else, mm -hmm. right? So when the connecting payment system to payment system, you're still going to have the model where, from a regulatory perspective, that bank is a responsible party for the gatekeeping services. They have the deep part pockets. They have the surveillance responsibility that is, um, you know, very highly uh, a lot of high expectations of it. But that's, that's a path forward that, again, you can do incrementally build on, build on, build on over time. And I think that's kind of a directionally where we can go. Um, you know, there's a whole nother model that says uh, over time, from a government perspective, they just start mandating, dictating, um, you know, the issuance of digital currency in their, in their local market, right? So you say MAS in Singapore says, you know what, we're moving to... Um, a digital currency, deposits on the bank, we're going to issue digital currency, everybody's got to be part of this model, and then you, gotta, you, know, you have to change uh, exchange value through wallets, through your, through, your, uh, through your customers, and then the UK does it, then another market does it, then they decide to start exchanging value between those marketplaces, right? And then we're all out of it, <laughs> you know, in terms of participation. But that's a model. Yeah. That's a model that can happen. But I'm hoping... We can kind of incrementally improve the services enough. Nobody thinks about that, even though I think they still will. But, um, but I think there's a path there. And it's, it may not be perfect, but I think we can deliver a pretty good solution, and actually better than pretty good. I think we could deliver a real solid solution um, that works um, far better than it does today mm -hmm. and gets us to you know, a place that really, I think, satisfies what customers would need to do. You know, I, I, I think of GPI, and I know there are many other models, because I know there are uh, solutions being driven uh, organically out of different geographies. When, when GPI was first thought through in, in a modernization effort of correspondent banking, 
uh, addressing transparency, predictability, uh, being able to monitor and track. I know that there was lots of discussion around why can't you, like a FedEx model, know where a payment is in its completion, its status. You know, if you take it to that next level, which many of the solutions today, real time or otherwise, and I think about it in the B2B space, it's really about working capital. And how is it that we are looking to support our customer base and the experiences that they have in predictability, how it is that they want to make decisions real time or otherwise. And I, I think Andrew, you know, love your thoughts on it because uh, you know, I, at one point you said, for me, there would be a balance. It would be, uh, there will be different types of models that will offer around predictability, let's say. Well, I, I think of Swift GPI and it's all incremental improvements, which I expect to be made, et cetera, in the way that, uh, that Michael describes. I think that has been one of the solutions that will serve a certain customer base with certain transaction requirements. I don't think that it needs to be the only solution for every transaction internationally. And I don't think that, um, that, uh, that it need be as bank accent, sorry, as bank centric as uh, as Michael describes, because I think there is an appetite mm -hmm. for that to change, expressed by governments in terms of open banking legislation, payment service regulators, or whatever. So, you may not want that, but it's been decided in certain places already that you're going to have to accommodate that um, that absence of exclusivity. Now. It's another discussion whether or not you think that's uh, appropriate or whatever, but it is a fact of life in some countries already, and it's likely to get a hold elsewhere. So I think there will be different so solutions for different uh, uh, requirements. The, the situation you described, predictability, the, uh, the, the, the pre-validation, yep. the time, the cost, those are things that solutions like Earth uh, believe we've had a, yep. a head jump on. We're not a, for example, uh, uh, an alternative that is starting from scratch. And, and uh, in that sense, we think there are solutions that are out there for certain bases that are ahead of the Swift GPI game. And, but the other point on that is that I don't see it as competitive in the sense to come back to the original space because we're, we're offering this as a, 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 as a service for the banks, between the banks. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, I think that they can leverage this uh, innovation, if you like, and uh, it may not be for the entirety of the global payments uh, model, but for parts of it, it's, it's definitely a, a, a good option. And partnership is why I think, uh, it, partnership I think is a, is, a, is a great option because it reflects more than the desires of the banks. It reflects something that regulators want, that governments want, that consumers want, et cetera. It, and I think that's a variety of options. That's yeah, I, you know, it, and it, it's interesting. I think partnerships continues to come up over and over and, and, and having a different flavor in there. Yeah, I just, just to comment on that, I think the, the thing that would happen, and I, this is what I would see, is ultimately if these systems are opened up so you can access directly, the partnership model starts to evolve and becomes a little different, right? Yeah. Then you don't need the banks, then the need for partnership changes and evolves. And it's not that it's bad, right? It creates more competition, there's other things in it. Um, but I, I think that's part of, from an equation perspective, that is like, okay, so that would be creating a, a new model and how, who, between yeah. relationships between the participants. And, I, and I'd cautious, if I can, I'd, 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 I'm, I'm cautious about that because one of the things that we respect about, uh, about banks historically is, is how they've retained their customer base. You know, that trust won't be broken overnight. There are places where it, it, it has taken a knock in recent years for a variety of reasons. But uh, in terms of the scale, um, you rightly own such a huge customer base. Uh, and I say rightly because of the trust perspective that has been built up over 100 years in, in many cases, that you know, that's not going to fall away overnight. And as such, you will get to dictate a lot of those changes in terms of pace, uh, uh, and in terms of, uh, of access or whatever, the part, you choose the partners for one yeah. thing, you know? Well, I, I, I can't speak enough about trust. I know in our, uh, our own vision within our own organization, it sits as a pillar right at the top uh, and will continue to be as it does with our partners uh, in correspondent banking relationships. And, and I'm just going to touch one thing and then I'm going to pass it, Leila, to you. Uh, there were a couple of questions actually that came through that uh, I, I actually feel we've already touched on. You know, will incremental improvements suffice to build a global instant payments arena or will we need a disruptor driven revolution? I think we've had a lot of conversation <laughs> that there's going to be some balance. There'll be different flavors that will be available 
available, which is not unlike what we've seen to date, considering we have uh, global uh, exchange happening in a, in a multitude of ways already, as, as shown through our participants on here. But Leila, I'll pass it to you, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see what questions have come through from the yeah, audience. Yeah, uh, some very interesting comments, and, and, and I think insofar as priorities, which was the first point of your question, go, goes a, a lot of interesting comments around the issues that we're trying to solve, price, transparency, uh, tracking, um, speed, um, I, I think another problem that we need to, to solve, and this goes to some of what, what Andrew was saying around possibly having multiple parties, is that there are certain areas of the world, given our, our global economic growth that is so low at the moment, the developed world's growth is, is lagging. And I, I was looking at, at some of the stats in the uh, um, McKinsey report in, in one of the sessions earlier where they were highlighting that Asia is growing at over 30% and the world payments volumes are growing at 10.3%. I think what's really crucial in the future is that a payments environment is a network model. And so having multiple fragmented models is, is a bit tricky. And I think what's really important to make the network model work is that this can't only be dominated by um, the developed uh, countries and that we need inclusivity and we need the emerging markets to be at the center of this. And of course, everything that we build needs to be build around, built around the customer. I, I'm with Freddie Mercury on this. Um, and, and so the model that evolves may take a slightly different approach than the very simplistic adversarial view of banks versus uh, fintechs. And, and it may well be that there is a networked model, but that different participants have different roles to play in building aspects of that. And so you may end up having a, a, a uh, Amazon type model where the infrastructure and, and base marketplace is built by established players, and fintechs are, are building the overlay products or services on top of that. Um, what I do think, and, and where I do think the commercial and uh, global growth node will be, um, is in those institutions who are able to control and manage the customer interface. Um, I, I think that's a really crucial area, and I think that there are a number of untapped markets that um, perhaps in the traditional world we haven't spent as much time on in developing. Um, in Australia, we, our, our big growth frontier is the small and medium enterprise, and we're seeing some interesting solutions, and particularly insofar as cross-border goes. Uh, and so I think that that is a, a really important area. And you may well have different parties focusing on dem different demographic or, or market t uh, target segments. Um, and that's how they may be contributing to this network model. Uh, well, I, it's, and I love the, the fact that we keep making sure that we're anchoring back to the end user and the customer experience. And I, that certainly has come through from uh, each and every one of the panelists today. Uh, at the root of that, what are we solving for and what are those use cases and, and how we get there through partnerships uh, and through uh, different collaboration efforts is, is really key. I think that's more than apparent if you look at the sessions here just at Cybos, but more importantly, the conversations I'm sure each of us are having every day and uh, how we're going to get to those solutions, which does mean, uh, you know, everybody and every aspect in the chain has to really be paying attention, including correspondent banking. It was interesting, one of the questions that came through from a technology or a correspondent banking perspective really brought up blockchain. And it still is very front and center around a dialogue. And the question from the audience was, will blockchain technology play a role in correspondent banking in the future? And I didn't know if uh, anybody wanted to just... Uh, uh, I, I think blockchain or uh, distributed ledger is, is a very interesting uh, perspective. And I, I wonder if uh, in the audience you can put up your hands if you as an organization uh, yourselves or if you work 
closely with somebody who has a distributed ledger or blockchain pilot in the market. I can say in my home country, all of our banks have uh, pilots in this area. So if you can just put up your hands, if you either work close with, closely with, or you guys. now we're talking about pilots. Um, and now, how many of you um, work closely with or know somebody who has a distributed ledger solution that is live in the market. So I'm seeing two hands, I think. And three. three. And you. Three. <laughs> I think the point of the matter is that this is a, an exciting technology. There's no doubt that um, it, it holds uh, uh, the key to potentially unlocking a very different model but it's nascent, it's immature, and um, the scalability and the electricity usage and, and power usage is still being tested. And, uh, and I think we've got a bit of a way to go in that, and I'm, I'm sure I'm opening the door to a, a great debate. <laughs> well, I'd put my hand up because uh, working with a, a partner, a, a bank of, a, a network partner bank of ours, Santander, we are, uh, facilitating a live in production uh, uh, transaction in, in a certain area which has an element of distributed ledger in it um, but it's small it's uh, it's not a pilot in the sense that it is live it, it is right. it is uh, in the in, in the production environment but you know it's solving a particular problem at a, sick, a particular point in the chain um, it's it's proof that there is advantage to be had here, and it helps people to focus on where we can really use this within the environment that currently exists, that is the regulatory and, and techno technological environment, or whatever, rather than just talking about how it's going to revolutionize the universe next week. And I do think that, rather like Michael said about, uh, uh, about the SWIFT solution uh, for international payments, the um, incremental improvement is what we'll see there. Personally, I have a view, not a sports view necessarily, whatever. I have long thought that, uh, uh, trade payments would be the obvious so, sort of uh, uh, clamour for that, yeah. and yet it's not the first place that everybody's tried it out. So I, I think maybe things have gone the wrong way around there. Uh, I don't see. I don't think somebody like me will, uh, in the rest of my career, will find himself usurped by my lack of knowledge about blockchain and, and, and yeah. DLT. I think there's a place for a lot of us for a long time before that takes over the world. Yeah. And yeah. and I agree. I, I think there's there's some. Uh, interesting and actually very valid use cases that we've seen. Um, the widespread deployment from a global cross-border perspective, you know, if that advances, I, I, I believe that advances only in the model of government-issued digital currency, if we get to that place. Uh, just naturally advancing, I just don't, don't see that in the near term. It would take longer. But there are absolutely some very valid use cases for it that May, may pick up quite a bit more um, in the nearer term. Again, just mm -hmm. widespread payments, probably not near term. Michael, if I, if I can just add to that, I, I think in many cases, a really sophisticated database could do a far better job than distributed ledger. But the area within our world that I think possibly could be a very interesting use case is in digital identity. And I, I was interested to hear Tim Berners-Lee commenting on, on that at his uh, breakfast discussion this morning that uh, we could put our identities onto um, the blockchain. And, and so I, I don't foresee that it's highly likely that we're going to have a, a network high volume payments environment tomorrow. Um, but I do think a, a promising potential medium to long term use case is digital ID and authentication. Which is where it would align with trade payments perfectly. Exactly. You know, so it's a yeah. gateway. Yeah. But validation. Yeah. 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 And, and I think my permission to say. Uh, no, I only can uh, uh, agree what what I said, what was said, and I don't want to repeat it. But also from Econ's worldline perspective, we have digital identity uh, uh, yeah. solutions in place uh, uh, in the Netherlands, for instance. Yeah, we run there also with the government and the banks uh, such such a solution, and so this is why I can the only. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Confirm on uh, what, what was said here in, in, in mm -hmm. the panel very much. I, I just have to, I know I've said it before, but it's events like this that bring us together 
that as we are looking within our own marketplaces, uh, that we have an opportunity to see what is happening uh, across other markets. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone. We're going to actually end with a final poll question. So coming back to the, the initial question here on uh, real-time payments, and I'm looking at my friends at the back. There we go. Uh, what we thought we would do is just have a little fun with real-time payments. So by when will we be able to pay the Cyboss taxi driver instantly, and by the way, I paid mine cash yesterday evening, uh, wherever we came from in the world, and will that be in Sydney, in Cyboss 2018, London in 2019, Boston 2020, Singapore 2021, or never? Uh, and as you uh, poll your questions, I do want to thank my panelists. It has been uh, actually a great experience, both just in our prep work here today, learning so much both about your, your views and your positions and how you're working through it, uh, as well as uh, we want to thank everyone from the audience for your time. I know that uh, we did answer a few of the questions that came through uh, electronically. If you have any other questions, I'm sure uh, the panelists will be happy to answer them at any point throughout the, the conference. So I look forward, obviously, to 2021 in Singapore. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.